LeBron James didn't just disagree with Donald Trump, he insulted the president. Yet when the GM of the Houston Rockets tweeted a pro-Hong Kong protester message, James treaded ever so lightly to avoid even a hint of disagreement with China. Now, some might say that's a bit hypocritical and they'd have a point. Not a good look for James. The same could be said of the NBA as a whole. Despite being fairly outspoken on social issues domestically, the NBA chose non-confrontation after that tweet. Hypocritical sellouts, that's what many said, and at least as compared to how they approach politics domestically, James and the NBA probably deserve some criticism there. But relative to China and just thinking of China, what else should the league have done? What could they have done? To answer that question, we're going to look at the broader issue. What should U.S. companies and America in general do to support democracy and human rights in China and around the world? To answer this, we'll start by making three quick points. First, whatever we've been doing so far to support democracy and human rights, it's not working. Only one out of six people in the world today live in a fully functioning democracy. Not only has that ratio barely moved in 50 years, researchers tell us democracy has actually been on the decline for the last 12 years. More specifically, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Arab Spring, all produced very little democracy, indicating that even regime change and revolution don't necessarily produce democracy. Secondly, did you know that an estimated 1.8 million people in India are victims of police torture every year, or that India is one of the most corrupt countries in the world? This verbiage here next to me is actually excerpted from a write-up on India's political system from a leading NGO, Freedom House, that tracks democracy. Keep in mind, all of this very undemocratic behavior comes after 70 years of elections and supposed democracy on the part of India. In India's defense, all less developed countries have the same problems, whether they have elections or not. The question is, why haven't 70 years of elections solved these problems? And why aren't we pressuring India to prove its corruption and police coercion and other such problems? Thirdly, the NBA problem in China isn't just with the government. China's had many nationalist backlashes, like this one against the NBA, and they're mostly led by the people, although, of course, the government plays a role. Now, not all Chinese agree on everything, but putting nationalism ahead of democracy or freedom of speech, probably more mainstream than otherwise in China today. Now for the analysis that brings all these points together. And by the way, if you've watched any of our other videos that touch on democracy, you've heard this message before. In this one, we'll, we'll keep it short. When we support democracy and human rights, we tend to think of it like this. The people always want and are ready for democracy. It's the government which has to change. And of course, here's how we change it. Elections first, then political democracy, and then economic growth change later, if at all. Unfortunately, we're wrong about this. Here's how it really works. The people aren't culturally ready for democracy. The government reflects the people, doesn't really act as a gatekeeper. So first you have to change the people, who then changed the government. And the real process looks like this. Economic growth first, which changes the culture, people become empowered, the rule of law strengthens, and the cultural change then makes people ready to demand and support democracy. Now, as you can see, this formulation helps explain our other points, why democracy hasn't spread very far, why poor countries aren't good democracies, and how people sometimes aren't terribly democratic. Now, you see this part here? Business, particularly foreign business, does the hands-on, in-the-weeds work that drives cultural change, bringing standards, practices, values, behavior that are critical to non-democratic countries as they develop. If you think foreign businesses can't make that kind of values contribution, it's probably because you've never worked in a developing country. This type of engagement, this, this contribution, helping the process of cultural change, is the most important thing business can contribute. It ought to be the priority, maintaining constructive engagement. Now, that doesn't mean everything else falls by the wayside. First, foreign companies have to conduct themselves with the highest standards. Contributing to the local corruption problem is not an acceptable engagement. Secondly, you can live your values and stand up for them when necessary without being a political activist. And lastly, there are going to be highly sensitive areas like surveillance of minority groups that demand another approach, you know, disengagement, not involvement. You have to be wary of those areas. So I'm not saying engagement at all costs, but contrary to what some people think, engagement works and it helps pave the way to not just prosperity, but freedom and democracy. Engagement should be the priority. A closing thought. We think concepts like these are important. We insist on them in politics. 
but we simply don't recognize how critical they are economically. And more importantly, we don't recognize that if you don't have these concepts here, you won't have them here. And since the economic side comes first, we ought to spend more time thinking about how we can use business and economics to build the foundation for real democracy. This is Dan Joseph of the Global Dashboard. Thanks for watching.